Welcome everyone to ISOC's inaugural Tech Talk series. Uh, my name is uh, Oyi. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for ISOC. Uh, today we have a very exciting panel uh, to discuss a very interesting topic. And this panel, as I noticed, actually we, we come across uh, very different locations. We have Ben uh, in the US, Josh in the UK, Yao Ti in China, and Jocelyn and myself in, in Singapore. So it's a very global panel, so very, very exciting. Uh, and this, we're here to discuss today regulated finance meeting decentralized finance. Is it a complement or a competition? Now, uh, as you know, DeFi is a trend to decentralize core traditional financial use cases using blockchain technology. But the question here is how can technology built for decentralization be integrated effectively in an industry that's largely required centralized governance uh, in order to operate? Now, uh, we have a very esteemed panel right here joining us, and uh, I would like to introduce all of them. First, we have Ben Chan, who is CTO of BitGo. Ben began building Bitcoin and blockchain infrastructure projects since 2012. He pioneered the first Bitcoin and Ethereum multi-sig web wallets during the early years in crypto. He's passionate about DeFi, lowering counterparty risk, and democratizing access to financial services. We also have with us Jia Yao Ti. Uh, his video is uh, slightly patchy, but hopefully he, he can join us um, properly. He's the head of engineering Asia for Parity Technologies. Prior to Parity Technologies, he was the co-founder and CTO at Zilliqa. He was selected to the Forbes 30 under 30 Asia list in 2019. He obtained his PhD from NUS, uh, National University of Singapore. And his research proposes several technologies as the building blocks for next-gen blockchain that addresses consensus and privacy issues. We're also very happy with, to have with us Jocelyn Chang, Southeast Asia Community Lead for Maker Foundation. She focuses on building community in the Asia-Pacific region for Maker Foundation, driving the adoption of DAI and the Maker Protocol. She's a tech enthusiast, embracing new applications that make the world a better place. Congratulations to MakerDAO, by the way, for becoming the first uh, DeFi protocol to hit 1 billion uh, total value unlocked. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Josh Goodbody. He's the Director of European and Latin American Growth and Institutional Business for Binance. He brings traditional finance and fintech experience, having worked at State Street, JP Morgan Asset Management, and also Huopi, where he was most recently Global General Counsel, as well as Head Oh, and subsequently head of European and Americas for Poppy's uh, global institutional business. Josh is an expert in legal and regulatory affairs, as well as the increasing emergence of institutional involvement in the cryptocurrency market. So having introduced uh, this very esteemed panel, I'm gonna kick off with a couple of questions for, for all of the panel, and we can start with uh, Ben and, and move down to Yao Ti and Jocelyn and, and Josh. The first question uh, for Ben uh, is about how blockchain removes inefficiencies in traditional capital markets. Uh, we at iStocks, for example, have benefited from blockchain technology because we, we really see it as a heart of uh, taking away a lot of the inefficiencies, for example, fractionalization, immutability of records, speed of settlement, etc. Uh, but I'd love to hear from Ben first, you know, how do you see blockchain actually removing inefficiencies in traditional capital markets? Ah, sure. So I think for me, the biggest property of uh, blockchain uh, that removes inefficiencies is just how open it is and how uh, it is very programmable. So uh, as long as an entity has access to a blockchain, uh, that entity is able to not just use the services that are already on, those block, uh, on, on the blockchain, but also to offer additional uh, services uh, on top of it. So... Um, some of the inefficiencies that, that you look at in traditional uh, capital markets, uh, can you hear me? I, I heard something, but uh, okay, I'm just going to continue here. So um, some of the inefficiencies that, that uh, I see in traditional capital markets are often to do with number one, um, speed of which you can settle. Uh, so sending a wire, say, from uh, the US to Singapore, and second, uh, the way that uh, different entities can 
uh, interact and build on top of each other. So first, um, speed of, of settlement. In, in many blockchains, you're able to settle uh, you know, uh, within 10 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, or as quickly as, as mere, mere seconds. So I think that that uh, really helps with uh, global transfers and being able to trade with counterparties uh, anywhere else and, and not having to have a settlement process that is you know, once every day or two days. And what that means is that you can have access to more funds uh, without having to consider them locked uh, while they are while they are in settlement, and 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 that and that provides more capital efficiency. So uh, the second one is to uh, with regards to what I I think is very uh, you know I'm, I'm passionate about in blockchain, which is that it is very open, and that is that uh, as I was saying, you, you are able to uh, take advantage of. Uh, your funds on multiple platforms and also uh, have multiple platforms that can, uh, you know, um, utilize uh, each other, both in terms of for liquidity as well as for products. So what do I mean by that? I mean, as an example, um, I think that DeFi allows for very uh, composable um, uh, innovation. So to, il to illustrate, you know, you could have a, a asset management product like token sets, and it may be developed by a team in San Francisco. It's using you know, an open uh, decentralized exchange in order to make a market for its uh, fund products. Um, and that decentralized exchange could exist uh, by a team that created it from Asia. And that is uh, you know, having uh, products listed on it that may be tokenized uh, or, or issued by companies in New York. And, and many users of the application could also obtain yield at the same time as uh, um, when they have the when, when they have the tokens in a fund, using lending pools uh, which are developed using smart contracts uh, in say Europe or, or Israel, for instance, and and so that that allows for a lot more open uh, innovation, and and I think that that um, uh, really can be compared to like opening up of the app stores that brought a huge boom to the smartphone industry, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to just having a single. Uh, centralized uh, company building the applications. Great, thank you for that. Uh, ELT, are you able to share with us what are some of the uh, elements you see blockchain, uh, uh, you know, helping inefficiencies in the traditional capital markets? Oh, it's a bit soft. Uh, okay, I think we. I don't think we can hear him very well. Uh, why don't I move to Jocelyn and then we can we can come back if if that works. Jocelyn, yeah. Sure. yeah. So um, I mean, so DeFi is a subset of blockchain, right? So I'm just gonna talk, uh, you know, like mention more about DeFi itself. So um, so DeFi, uh, what I see is you know an alternative to existing financial system, um, um, you know, out there today. So what you can do as a user is that you'll be able to actually use DeFi to borrow and lend, to buy and sell, um, you know, all different kinds of exotic securities um, and to acquire insurance and make claims, you know, all via completely decentralized network uh, and protocols. So with DeFi, you know, there, there are no banks, you know, no brokers, no trusted third parties uh, required, uh, just, just the software itself. So what I see is that, you know, the great driving force behind, you know, this whole DeFi movement, it's really about, uh, you know, the openness and transparency itself, like what Ben uh, mentioned just now. So, um, I mean, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the folks here, right, on the call uh, would agree to a certain extent that the current um, today's solution um, of sending money and buying stocks is actually not the most efficient. I mean, you know, we are living in a digital age, but, uh, uh, you know, like for sending money from us to say singapore it takes it still takes like you know three to five days or, 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 or more uh, and the cost is like you know like uh, uh, at least uh, five to ten percent um so there's a lot of frictions because there are many layers of intermediaries here uh and um and but and DeFi is not a single product uh, or company but uh instead as a set of products you know and services that uh that that to, together compose you know uh, different uh, different 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 tools um, uh, like but uh, like what Ben actually mentioned. So um, I I I also see that you know it is a replacement 
or I mean, I wouldn't say replacement, but maybe an alternative for just existing financial primitives, like, you know, lending, borrowing, hedging, um, insuring, you know, in a better, cheaper and faster and, uh, and a permissionless and decentralized environment. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, Josh, uh, what about you? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I fully agree. I think, <clears throat> you know, DeFi, first of all, maybe we take a step back and we realize how new this is, right? So DeFi is, is something that's incredibly new um, for, for our industry, let alone the wider economy. So what we're seeing now are the, are the kind of grassroots uh, initial builds of what will be the DeFi of the future. And even though we're at this really early stage, we're seeing massive adoption already. So as you mentioned, you know, make, congratulations to MakerDAO, um, seeing you know, $1 billion uh, in, in assets in their, in their protocol. We've seen about $3 billion uh, in total locked up, in total, total value of assets sitting within DeFi ecosystems. That's a massive amount, but we're still at a very early stage. So I think what we're yet to see is mainstream uh, adoption of DeFi solutions yet. And, and that really comes with making DeFi accessible. So as a general concept, DeFi does exactly what Jocelyn and, and, and Benedict points to. It disintermediates all of these multiple expensive layers that have been built over the years in traditional finance that really act as you know, a, a detrimental cost to the average person, the average consumer. Most of us have been very much kind of acclimatized and used to, you buy your stocks here, you uh, buy your fixed income products there, you have a personal uh, fund manager that has to do X, Y, and Z for you. And everything that you do in your financial life is managed by a party that is taking a slice of the transaction or a fee. And in many cases, the fees are quite punitive. So finance has really been something that, that only those that are relatively wealthy have been able to, to, to really take advantage of. So DeFi gives us as a community the ability to build these tools, really powerful financial tools for a wider audience. And I think we're right at the beginning of that journey, but the wonderful disintermediation and the open ecosystem that, that DeFi provides for people to develop and create solutions, people to interact with these solutions in a really fast, frictionless, cheap way um, is really the, the beginning of hopefully a, a new wave of democratizing um, personal finance and, and kind of corporate finance in, in ways that we haven't really seen before. Thanks for that. Uh, Yao Ti, we've finally got you on. Um, yes. <laughs> we'd love to hear your views about, uh, you know, blockchain and inefficiency. How do you see that uh, solving all these issues in traditional capital markets? Yeah, it's a very nice question. For me, I, I really treat DeFi and open finance a very good way to enable startups to build this financial inclusion to some more users with its unique advantages. Like first, with DeFi, right, user can really have less trust to the centralized parties, but you can have more trust for the on-chain program or the smart contracts we call. And these smart contracts actually are running immutably and transparently. So with such transparency of the DeFi products, including some open source on-chain code, uh, which can easily be verified by a lot of uh, technical people. And this can actually uh, ensure that there's no black box operations for these products. So everything is transparent. So investors can kind of really understand what's the logic of such product. And further, the current blockchain infrastructure actually lowers the development or the maintenance cost for the DeFi products. For instance, right now, if a startup want, wants to launch a very decent lending or exchange product, he can just deploy maybe 100 lines of smart contract code on Ethereum. And soon he can just launch a very uh, like simple and elegant uh, lending product. So users can directly use their wallets to buy or lend uh, their assets. Uh, and in addition, the openness of DeFi uh, which I feel is a very uh, brilliant idea and uh, uh, innovation. So basically allow users across different countries or regions to exchange, lend or borrow assets freely, uh, which also lowers the entry barrier for different users to access such financial products. Uh, for example, uh, you can uh, typically, when we do 
uh, cross-border payment. For example, if I want to transfer some USD from Singapore to the UK, right, London. So I need to uh, ask the banks to do the SWIFT. Typically, it may take like two days. And with, for example, $25 cost from my side, and the recipient also need to pay maybe another $25. But here, if you transfer, for example, I transfer some uh, like stablecoin, USDC, uh, from Singapore to uh, London, I can just um, send a, a simple transaction, even the amount may be like 100K, but the transaction fee actually is just $1. And it can be finished within one minute. So as you can see, right, it's very fast. And uh, if, you, if, if you transfer a large amount, the relatively the cost is super low. And so basically with the transparency, and uh, also the the low uh, development cost the plus this kind of uh, openness can really help these DeFi products to sort of um, outperform the traditional uh, financial products. Yeah, in my opinion. Great. Well, it sounds like there's a common pain point here, right? Cross border currency flows. <laughs> Uh, the, the next question, and I, I love it that we have such an international panel here and, and the different perspectives, uh, because I think this will be quite interesting. Um, you know, if, if for a user today, uh, what, what does DeFi look like? Um, let, let's start with Ben. Uh, if I were to use DeFi now, what, what's the user experience like currently? Well, um, I think the way you think about DeFi is that it's actually a, not a single entity that's running, running DeFi. So... What it started out with is, is several little applications and, and projects that were building applications uh, using smart contracts for you to uh, manage your finances. And some, some projects uh, specialize in lending, some projects specialize in uh, trading, some projects specialize in asset management. And so uh, this was the case up to about uh, a year ago where you really have many f um, you know, fundamental basic building blocks um, you have lending, and that's on a separate website. You have trading, that's on a, its own website. And, uh, you know, you can have fund management, but you've got to go to this fund management website. Like, uh, and, and you have many other structured products as well. And so what has happened since then is that many, uh, because of how open it is to get access to this, it's all, it's all just on the blockchain, and you just inter interact with the blockchain through um, a few lines of code. Um, many uh, other applications, uh, such as Instadap, uh, have come up on top of that layer, and built around them. Um, so it, you could almost think about them like a browser which has multiple applications linked up underneath. And so they, they try to uh, create a more like, um, you know, f wholesome approach where you can get lending and you can get um, buy-sell next to each other. And, and then they try to create a, uh, uh, um, a product on top of that where you can lend and you can use some of what you borrowed to go um, margin long on, on um, you know, a trade. And, and of course, it's not always that simple, but that's what the, you know, that, that's, that's where the DeFi uh, industry has been for about, you know, six plus months. And so today, it's still, in my opinion, really early stages, uh, set of different applications underneath. Um, and I think, uh, I hope that as this matures, it will be much easier to use for the customer. Um, and uh, also much more scalable, right? Because today, uh, uh, like Josh said, we we're seeing like 3 billion, I think it was 4 billion um, as, as of late uh, assets under management in the DeFi space. Um, it's, still, it's still rather small compared to the, 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 you know, the total amount of liquidity and, and assets in, in CeFi, even for just crypto. Uh, Justin, uh, how about you? And... Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I do agree with Ben and the, see the first generation of the apps was actually built by blockchain, you know, enthusiasts for blockchain enthusiasts, right? So, um, you know, the D apps, uh, user interface and user experience was not, you know, like very, very smooth actually. And, uh, but, um, um, it's, and, and the usability is actually not there for regular users or, or any layman out there. So what I see is that the latest iterations of DeFi apps uh, are prioritizing more on design right now and uh, the ease of use so uh, that, you know, uh, it's easier to actually uh, get uh, layman to, to try out like, you know, all these different 
see it. For example, uh, Arjun and Dharma Wallet, they do have a very slick user interface. Um, and uh, what I see is that um, I guess, you know, like um, three, five years down the road, we'll be seeing more, you know, better user experience DX in the, in the DeFi space. Great, thank you. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I fully agree with that. I think, you know, historically DeFi has been something that has been more tailored to blockchain enthusiasts. Um, and really what we're seeing now is the, the beginning of creating, uh, you know, much more easy to use, much more easy to interact with services and applications that your average person could use. And that's the right direction of play. We need to be moving in that direction. Um, from a Binance perspective, you know, we've had a DEX for a long, long time um, and we've gathered a lot of user feedback and, and user feedback primarily comes down to it's not as easy to use as your centralized solution. Um, and I think as, as, a, as a service provider, we're conscious that you'll always have different segments of a market. You'll have consumers um, that are, you know, very, um, for example, not technical, should we say, um, that just want to use a service that works and that's easy to use, then there are others that want much more control over their entire interaction with blockchain services. So they want to, for example, hold their own keys, right? And they want to have a, um, a, a trading experience which allows them to go from their own custodial solution uh, onto a, a, an exchange solution and then back into their own custodial solution. And they don't want to have to use an exchange's hot or cold wallets. Um, so with that kind of lessons learned, we realized that, you know, we're quite far off from having um, a, a, a shift from these centralized solutions to decentralized solutions just yet. But what we absolutely do see is the easier that we make it as an ecosystem, the more and more people are happy to uh, interact with it. Um, and I think people are realizing that there are an inherent benefits in, in decentralized finance um, that give you much more control and less uh, exposure to entities that you don't know anything about, frankly, you don't know how well run they are. Um, perhaps, you know, as we've seen in certain blockchain scams, perhaps there are concerns about scams um, and people operating and bad actors um, operating exchanges in the wrong way. Um, you know, People have legitimate concerns and DeFi is one great way um, with the right UI and UX to give people the ability to um, have a little bit more control over how they interact with the blockchain ecosystem. Thank you for that. Well, I'm sure we'll have a bit more discussion around security uh, uh, after this, but uh, let's uh, hear from Yao Qi. What is your impression of user experience in the DeFi space at the moment? Yeah, I think at this moment, right, the user experience is much better than the one we had like one or two years ago. Like one or two years ago, basically, you have to hold your private key and uh, either you need to install a browser extension like MetaMask to operate a lot of assets by ourselves. Right now, we have a lot of uh, good UI and UX. So basically, user can just click a bunch of buttons and you can... You can have some uh, similar products like uh, fixed deposit or even <laughs> flexible deposit on the page. And you just need to click a bunch of buttons. And after that, you can really get the super high earnings or the interest, for example, over 10 or 20%. Um, but meanwhile, the, uh, meanwhile there, there are also a bunch of, I would say, uh, the we we won't call it shortcomings. I just say it's just something we, we need to improve in the future. Uh, for example, right now, if you want to trade or if you want to use some uh, good different products, typically you have to pay very high transaction fees. Um, that's why just now in the first question, I used the example, you have to manage a large amount of assets, for example, over uh, tens or thousands um, US dollars, then the transaction fees or trading fees can be very minimal uh, compared to your capital. But if you just want to trade like hundred dollars, typically the transaction fees for the simple ones, uh, for the transfer, maybe just one dollar, but, but for something like trading like from one side to another side, or uh, for example, you want to do the fixed deposit, they may charge you 20 or $30 um, every time. 
So the, the, the high track session fees actually is, uh, is a matter for us to improve in the future. And meanwhile, uh, associated to the high transaction fee, it's about the, the, uh, the latency. Um, so basically the current for most of our device on Ethereum, you cannot do the uh, high frequency trading. Um, so the thing that the throughput of the platform or infrastructure doesn't support such high volume of tradings. So basically what you can do that, you can put your bid, but you need to wait for some time. For example, you need to wait for a bunch of blocks, like uh, several minutes, to make sure your fund really go to the smart contract and uh, you get the, the 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 other assets from the smart contract, and uh, and also associated to this one, it's about liquidity. Uh, sometimes, since DeFi is still very new in a very nascent stage, so the liquidity for some assets is not that good. Uh, so if you want to do a lot of trading, uh, the uh, the speed page may be very huge and uh, it, it cannot be a constant rate for you trade from one side to another side. Yeah, that, that's sort of the current limitations or restrictions, but I believe for the next two to three years with more good infrastructure coming out and the more uh, developers entering this space, we can definitely solve most of these limitations or issues. Well, that's a great lead in, uh, you know, the, to sort of really getting into the depth of, of this uh, discussion topic, right? Because, you know, Ben, this is this question's for you. Will DeFi compete with or complement traditional capital markets, given the technology is likely to be evolving very rapidly in the next couple of years? Where do you see that playing out? Yeah, um, I think this is a very interesting question because at BitGo, we have offered both uh, decentralized uh, and centralized uh, traditional uh, capital market services um, for some time. Since 2013, we ran a decentralized wallet infrastructure, a scalability and security platform used by many of the crypto exchanges. That, and then we process about 15% of global Bitcoin volume today. But we are also a custodian. We have traditional financial services on top of that, making a C5 stack. So I think going back to your question, I think what we first look at is why some people think that C5 and DeFi are competitive. So, uh, you know, DeFi provide some similar service, services as CFI, um, such as the ability to obtain yield by supplying or loaning out assets, ability to trade, um, you know, create uh, contracts for differences and uh, participate in structured products. And you know, as of today, CFI markets are larger and more liquid, but I think what's interesting is that the way DeFi can provide uh, these services is in a very open manner. So anyone can be a counterparty. And in fact, uh, can be a counterparty with very minimalized trust and risk because of the, of the blockchain. And so there's an interesting state right now in that DeFi is actually not the most accessible to the everyday user, um, and, but it still has some attractive properties. So sometimes the interest rates offered on DeFi loans may be more attractive um, uh, than traditional markets. Uh, you can get a high interest rate say if you're loaning out certain types of assets. Uh, or, you know, within DeFi markets, there may be trading opportunities that are not quite available in CeFi because of, uh, you know, cross-border friction in, in settlement, or there may be actually new products or assets available for trading in DeFi. So what I think that traditional markets, uh, traditional financial services can do initially is um, just try to use DeFi services as a counterparty, uh, meaning that when they're, is you know a better trade available on the DeFi markets than offer those uh, uh, prices or interest rates to uh, the customer, and then later on at later stages, then they could look into making uh, you know additional DeFi products available within CeFi uh, to the to the users. So um, services like uh, asset management, staking, governance, you know, other ways to uh, receive yield and, and so on. And so I think uh, to summarize, I feel like. Uh, DeFi services can be complementary to CeFi services and can be positioned as a unique counterparty because of how open they are. They're not, you know, biased to closing at any certain amount of time or saying, I don't want to work with this entity because they're a competitor. Um, and they also have several innovative products to offer and, and minimize counterparty risk at the same time. Great. Well, it's a great call to action to CeFi players to, you know, start taking a very hard look at, at DeFi uh, applications, right? Um, 
So this this next question uh, goes to Jocelyn. Uh, following following that that uh, answer from Ben, how how do you or how could um, this balance between governance and decentralization uh, play out? So I mean to add on what Ben uh, you know was saying, right? Uh, DeFi is actually not here to replace the existing financial system. So it is more of, you know, here to help, you know, organizations to improve uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, I'm just going to quote, like, you know, a few use cases uh, uh, within Maker Protocol, uh, which I would really like to share uh, with the audience. So, for example, uh, in the trade finance sector, uh, we are piloting a project uh, called Centrifuge. They're actually based out of the UK. Uh, and the, uh, the, the company name is called Centrifuge and the project name is called Team Lake. So Tindic actually um, enables, you know, like people to draw loans against tokenized real world assets, uh, you know, like any e-liquid uh, real world assets, uh, like, you know, invoices, warehouse receipts, uh, all the way to, you know, music royalty even. So, um, and, uh, you know, in traditional finance, uh, to borrow against, uh, you know, real world assets, you actually need the likes of uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, huge volumes and the cost of, uh, the cost of, uh, cost, uh, the overhead cost is actually very massive. Um, and, but with Tin Lake, what they did was that they actually tokenized and they, they actually tokenized and uh, managed to finance the mortgages in, you know, just less than 30 minutes with fees of less than, you know, a dollar. Um, and which I see that, you know, it is an alternative uh, to the say, status quo uh, that, that existed in the current, um, um, uh, uh, in the existing financial uh, ecosystem. So, um, so yeah, I do, I, 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 I mean, like I strongly agree with Ben that, you know, like DeFi is not here to actually replace like um, traditional um, financial institutions, but rather to complement. And also here in Southeast Asia, we actually have a, a partner. We work with a partner called Shuttle One. So they use DAI to facilitate trade financing for Singapore port. Uh, and uh, what customers actually need to do is that they need to drop off their invoices and then the, and records of their past transactions uploaded on the portal um, to show credit um, history and shorter one then we'll do the you know the whole data modeling um, and analytics thing um, and uh, uh, then um, uh, and process that whole credit uh, assessment uh, of all these different invoices being uploaded to the portal so um, and you know this is um, and and what happened after that is that um, a loan agreement will, at, will actually then be automatically generated upon uh, approval so um, I think we're treading um, in this very thin line of, you know, like uh, striking a balance between governance and decentralization. But I do believe that they both CFI and DeFi can actually coexist. Yeah, that, that's the that's the very interesting uh, perspective because you know governance and and, and laws and regulations to yeah. some extent uh, rely on a lot of. Um, homogeneity of, of, of the underlying, right? Think about securities laws and, and how they're developed. So I, I'm sure this, this technology being able to uh, disintermediate or, or to, to disrupt that thinking for a moment actually causes quite a, I, I'm sure causes quite a lot of angst to regulators who have to, to decide what to do with that. So the next question to Josh is, do you think regulators are ready for this? It's a great question. Um, I think <laughs> at a very high level, no, um, I think is the fair answer to that. I don't think they are fully ready for this. What I can say uh, from, from, from what uh, you know, I've seen around, around the world is that they're listening. Um, all of the, the larger, um, should we say, uh, financial market hubs, whether it's Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, London, uh, various US regulators, they're all listening. They're in kind of listening and learning mode at the moment. Um, and they're really trying to find uh, find out what these applications do, what the real world um, implications of these are, where the adoption will be, i.e. where they need to build a regulatory framework for these things. So what, what we tend to see historically with regulators at a global level is it's a bit of a square peg, round hole situation. It doesn't really fit. They try and make it work. They try and make it fit. Um, and it causes a lot of kind of unintended consequences. So 
with that in mind, and I think regulators have, have kind of around the world agreed that that's been a bit of a, a, a common um, secondary effect of, of trying to fit in new products and services into old regulatory regimes. They've been listening and learning and trying to create new frameworks. But the problem is DeFi is so new and is evolving so quickly. And the real world applications of, of DeFi are evolving at such a fast pace. For example, the, 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 the recent boom in so-called yield farming, that, you know, that, that has, is something that regulators are simply not ready for. They don't understand you know, how to incorporate that model of, um, of, of yield generation and um, lending yourself assets, re-lending yourself assets, generating yield off those lent assets. That's really new. And they, they haven't incorporated that into their existing frameworks. I think a lot of the blockchain community would say they don't need to, unless it falls within existing regulated activity, why should they build a regulated framework for it? And I think to a certain extent, that's correct. We shouldn't have regulation or law for the sake of it. There needs to be a real purpose for it. Um, now, there's some interesting, uh, you know, I would say case studies of regulators not really being able to sing from the same hymn sheet and, and speak with one voice on very simple things. And I'll give you one example here in Europe. Um, in Europe, most financial regulation is done at a pan-European level via um, the European Union, um, ESMA, European Securities Markets Authority, usually consults and creates these frameworks and they get rolled out uniformly across all European member states. Now, we haven't got a unified pan-European crypto regulatory framework just yet. So what that has caused is all the individual member states to create their own interpretation. So one very clear example of the massive divergence is in Germany, the financial regulator, the BaFin treats most crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the mainstream ones as a financial instrument. What that means is only broker dealers, right? So existing broker dealers, investment houses can trade those assets for clients. Whereas the rest of Europe and the UK included, which is now outside the European Union, have taken the view that crypto assets are not financial instruments. They fall into their own subset of an instrument of a cryptographic nature. So we're seeing the big divergences between regulators on actually quite simple fundamental things within the blockchain ecosystem, let alone you know, coming across all this new wave of, of, of DeFi products and services. So I think to answer your question in a nutshell, no, they're not ready, but the positive thing is they're listening and they're engaging with the community. What we'll see on the back of that, I think is still, still yet to be seen. Great. That, that's, a, that's a great answer, uh, which, which actually takes us to the next point. I mean, look, at the one end we have the regulatory, but the other end, uh, Yao Ti, this one is for you, is blockchain technology mature enough to support proper governance in a regulated environment? Yeah, and as you say, right, so the, the, the thing is we can, we can sort of have different categories for blockchain technologies. For example, for private or consortium chains, uh, typically run by different um, uh, corporates or enterprises. So for these uh, projects, right, um, like or, or chains, these uh, corporates or enterprises, they control the data or the flow of different uh, transactions. Um, yeah, for most of them, they really treat uh, the blockchain technologies as sort of uh, distribute, distributed uh, database technology. So they really treat it that way. And then you can easily apply, for example, KYC or AML or the other uh, compliance um, uh, tools or measures on the system itself. And then you basically can set up a proper a governance model on these chains for different applications. But uh, back to the public blockchain system like Bitcoin or Ethereum, actually it's very challenged. Uh, like I can give you a, a one example. For Bitcoin or Ethereum, it's um, by, by default, all the users on the chains, right? They are quite anonymous. So the, the, the only identity you can see uh, is a sort of uh, uh, a random stream. Uh, that's that that is the way to represent a user and they, we we call the public key or the address of the public key and then uh, from one user or one address so you can send the transaction sent to another user or another address 
So basically, it's it's a little bit beyond the current QIC and AML system, uh, because for the most of the QIC ML system, it's based on the uh, the sort of identity cards or the passports or all the uh, information from our from our physical world, right? It's not like the information from the crypto world. So they have to set up a dedicated database for the QIC ML, for example. Uh, I'm Yaochi. So under my name, what are the addresses belong to me? And based on that, they can basically track like uh, what are the transactions I've sent and what are the assets I received from other like uh, senders. So this way, the the basically uh, in te uh, in tech terminology we call it chain analysis, basically to analyze the transaction flows from one account to another account. And if everything is fine, uh, for most of the exchanges, I, as I know, right, they also have this chain analysis, basically analyzed for the past 50 blocks. Make sure that there is no like, transaction from some unknown or some malicious users. And then I can sort of pass the QIC or AML system and then they can allow me to do some uh, trading. Um, however, uh, in public blockchain system, we have the other system to anonymize your transaction, for example, a Zcash and a Monero. Um, the purpose of this chain is actually to apply some uh, very complex anonymity uh, measures or algorithms to make sure that no one can act to, no one can review the, the, the real identity of one transaction or like for example, A sends the transaction to B or C. So basically try to really anonymize everyone, even just, uh, even it's just uh, the crypto address. So so right now, as I know, right, for the KYC or AMS, they really treat these kind of transaction as a black hole. So basically uh, uh, for, for their users, they prefer the users don't uh, send their transaction to Zcash or Monero. But then back to the topic, right? Uh, if for the public blockchain space, I still feel that it's not that mature to really support the proper governance in this regulated environment. As you can see, right, we still need to build a very uh, comprehensive QIC ML systems. And meanwhile, we need to have proper accounting or legal system on top of these applications, uh, especially for the compliance. But at the moment, there are another example, for example, uh, Circle, they issued the USDC uh, stable coin and they got the license and it's a one to one pack to USD. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing that uh, if you want to buy USD, uh, USDC, uh, they, they will go through all the very strict KYC ML to basically check uh, all the information from you. And then after that, they, they think you are uh, properly compliant and then you can use your USD to exchange for USDC and then you can trade USDC. So uh, even we still have a long way to go to really achieve such uh, proper governance on chain. But I think granularly we can figure out uh, different uh, ways to really achieve uh, something in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, AML and, and KYC, it's obviously, uh, you know, government's obsession uh, at the moment. But but sort of, I think the other uh, government sort of viewpoint or, or, or risk perspective is also the security challenges, right? I mean, Ben, uh, this is a question for you. What are some of the security challenges that users at the moment face? And, and do you have any tips and strategies for, you know, let's say a new DeFi user to, to, uh, to use in thinking about security of their own accounts or, or any transactions? Yeah, I mean, so security when using a blockchain has always been very, very important because any asset transfers, and in fact, in DeFi, any uh, actions you take on top of an asset, uh, all of those are on chain. So mean, it, that means that they are uh, immutable, right? Like, so if, if you make a mistake or if your, uh, your information or your account has been uh, compromised, then um, it, it, you really have, uh, you know, very little recourse once those transactions have been settled on the blockchain, which they could be settled very quickly. Um, so, you know, over the many years, uh, Bitco has been ha having a mission to to really bring trust to the to the blockchain space by helping with storing and transferring of assets, and um, 
with DeFi, this just has gotten a little bit more challenging. Um, now, on one hand, the total amount of assets in DeFi hasn't quite got to the level of, of uh, you know, the total crypto space yet, which is several hundred billions in size, which, um, you know, we, we have built a lot of uh, multi-signature vaults and various technologies as well as physical processes around. Um, but I think if there was uh, one thing that I would say, I would recommend everyone look at, it's when you are uh, taking DeFi actions or using a DeFi wallet, um, it's very important to think about the single points of failure. So if you use a single DeFi wallet today, like say you just have a uh, browser wallet um, within, within Chrome and uh, you've set it up so that it's very easy to use uh, and which is not a bad thing, it's easy to use, right? Um, and you can say, make a trade um, with one single click um, and no secondary uh, device, uh, then that could be a single point of failure. Uh, what is also interesting, by the way, is that if you have a phone that has both a 2FA on the phone and the wallet on the phone, then that device itself, it's also a single point of failure. So you should always think about what, what are the single points of failure um, in, in any interaction that you make with the blockchain um, and try to set up your wallet um, or use a wallet that encourages you to uh, you know, have a 2FA or have a secondary approval on your phone, especially for uh, high you know, high value transactions. And so with DeFi, especially today, this is a challenge because in the past, valuing a transaction was just a matter of what is the value of this transaction that you're sending? Could be, you know, 10 Bitcoin or uh, anything above 100 ETH. Let's use a second factor. Um, now in DeFi, it's like, you know, um, I'm making a trade from one uh, crypto to another. Is that is that like a high value transaction? Yes, it is. But if the crypto is still within my account, then maybe that's not very risky. Um, then you have to say, you know, what about if, uh, if the asset that you're buying is very risky, right? Um, so, so that, that's where this is, this, this is an area that is still um, very, very early on in under active development. And I do think will become even, even bigger challenge, especially as, as DeFi grows really quickly. Well, that sounds like even C5 would, 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 would benefit from uh, those tips, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn, this, this one's uh, for you around governance. Do you, do you think proper governance can be ensured in a DeFi environment? I mean, um, I, I actually tune in to Access as a, you know, it's a self-regulatory organization here based in Singapore, right? Uh, they did a session on uh, FATF travel rule. So, and they talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, they are already regulating like centralized exchanges and wallets. I mean, you know, uh, and looking at the rate of how DeFi is growing today, uh, it might very well actually, uh, you know, uh, start hitting like DeFi uh, players very, very soon. So, and uh, I was talking to um, one of the members from Access and then he was like, hey, you know, like, uh, um, what they're going to do, what regulator is going to do is that, you know, once licensing is actually done, ring fencing would be the first thing that it actually, uh, yeah, that, that, that will take place. So meaning that uh, they will ring fence certain funds um, uh, within DeFi. Because uh, I think when when you actually convert fiat to uh, cryptos, right, that's where you start losing uh, the track of uh, where cryptos actually goes. Because there are a lot of different tools within DeFi space where you can use, like, you know, for example, mixers to just jumble up the, the addresses uh, in layman terms and um, and it's impossible to for for regulators to actually track uh, the, the, or the the source of uh, the funds itself so um, I actually uh, disagree with what Joss was saying because <laughs> the regulator are really catching up to what is happening like MES I, I was really MES was saying that you know hey um, uh, they, they actually understand you know how they're trying to understand the DeFi constructs and they also understand, you know, what are the up new and upcoming DeFi tools. So um, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's going to happen and, and yeah, I mean, like it's, it's, it will be very challenging, like what Ben was saying, but um, if DeFi were to grow to um, 
a, a bigger market cap, then you know regular will definitely step in to regulate and ensure proper a proper governance. Thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, Ti, what, what what do you think are some of the missing components in DeFi at the moment that that will get sort of that will start sort of converging regulations, regulated finance, and and DeFi? Yeah, so um, yeah, we come from uh, different uh, perspectives or aspects. Uh, first, uh, from a customer or a user perspective, I think one is uh, the user-friendly UI, because for a lot of these upcoming um, DeFi projects, right? If uh, if you look at the source code, <laughs> they are very simple uh, UI, um, like simple, very simple UI. It's just a bunch of buttons with a very nice uh, design. Uh, meanwhile, uh, for most of the very recent uh, DeFi projects, for example, the, some of them, they also cover options or futures. Um, since, it's, since it's very new, it's not a very good UI. So meanwhile, you also need to install the browser extension, as Ben just mentioned, like MetaMask. And then you, you, you need to click a bunch of buttons. Meanwhile, you have to understand the products very well. Otherwise, uh, if you miss click a button, uh, you may lose something. Um, meanwhile, from the tech perspective, as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, high transaction fees um, is sort of a very um, uh, urgent issue to solve, uh, not just for Ethereum, almost for all the different projects. So if, if, if the transaction fee is still very high, we couldn't really get a lot of retails, right? Um, we the, the most of the customer may just like like the the like the the very uh, wealthy uh, token holders. Uh, meanwhile, it's about the throughput. If the current blockchain can really achieve maybe thousand transaction per second, then we can do much more uh, interesting stuff than the current uh, stage. Uh, right now, a lot of uh, DeFi projects are quite limited by the like fifteen transaction per second. Um, so basically, you cannot do a lot of interesting stuff like high frequency trading on it. For example, deploy a bot there, and uh, everything can be done automatically. Then it's about uh, the or, uh, Oracle. Uh, right now, for most of the different projects, they they are re, uh, they are relying on the external uh, information. For example, um, the the token or asset price from the centralized exchange. Uh, then you need a very secure and uh, <clears throat> secure and uh, uh, consistent uh, sort of uh, Oracle to feed this information into the DeFi projects. Uh, and right now for most of Oracles, the, the functionality are still quite limited um, and uh, maybe just about the token um, price, not about stock price or the other general information. And at the end, as OE just mentioned, right, the compliance issue. So we, we really need a very good like QIC ML for the DeFi projects. Until now, I, I haven't seen like very uh, good ones for the newly uh, DeFi project yet. For example, op op options and the futures. Meanwhile, the, the chain analysis, like to analyze the transactions or the asset flow from one account to another account. Um, and I think for most of uh, individuals or the users, Basically, we are we are very interesting about the how to handle uh, tax matters, right? If we use these DeFi projects, do 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 uh, does uh, IRS treat it as uh, capital gain, or in any other countries, uh, for example, in the US, how they treat uh, the gain from this, and uh, how we handle uh, tax. If we couldn't pay tax, then how we handle such assets? Do we still treat it like digital numbers, or it's real asset? And uh, so basically, I think we are still in this uh, very nascent stage. Um, that's why a lot of new things and interesting, uh, interesting things are coming out. Uh, and we still have time to really improve all the uh, DeFi projects and uh, try to uh, basically build these missing components. And, uh, and in the future, definitely, I think we can see more interesting uh, DeFi projects, or maybe also combination of DeFi and uh, centralized finance products. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that, um, Josh. Uh, last question before we sort of move on to the open Q and A. 
you know, it's a bit of oxymoron, but what are some of the trade-offs that will come along with uh, trying to control decentralization? Yeah, I mean, you know, decentralization is a really broad term. You know, how decentralized is decentralized, right? And I think for lots of DeFi services or applications, they all come from somewhere. Someone builds them and then they get deployed into the wider ecosystem. And what all DeFi product providers are trying to do is continually decentralize them to really, you know, to, to embody the ethos and spirit of, of what decentralized finance is trying to do, i.e. remove single points of failure, remove counterparty risks. So in that sense, I think it's a really interesting place that we're in watching projects continue to decentralize their products and services. Um, and I think, you know, it all comes down to core blockchain ecosystem uh, issues, like, for example, proof of stake. When you're putting an asset out there, how do you create a governance model that is truly decentralized and can't be gamified? How do you kind of create uh, fallbacks and safeguards to not put too much power into the hands of the few? Um, I think it's a really, really difficult topic because there are inherent trade-offs when you make something too decentralized from the outset, like a DEX. There's no liquidity there. So larger players in the market can't interact with that and do what they do on a centralized exchange just yet. Um, so there's an inherent trade-off at the moment that people are trying to find a bit of a balance. And we haven't found it just yet. I think we're getting there. But, and, and, and those balances will you know, be found probably by smart participants in the ecosystem that will find ways to bridge the DeFi and the CeFi ecosystems in, in hopefully seamless and frictionless ways. But those trade-offs have to be made at least at the outset. Um, and one great example of that, as I mentioned, is you know, DEXs have historically had pretty thin liquidity. Um, if you want to do small, uh, small size transactions, small volume transactions, doing on a DEX is fine. But if you do uh, larger trades, um, as one of the participants mentioned earlier, the slippage can be massive. So you realistically wouldn't do that on a DEX. So we're dealing and grappling with these, uh, with these trade-offs at the moment, I think. Um, but as we all... CFI and DeFi participants learn how to interact better, I think that there will be interesting solutions that act as a bridge between the two. Great. Well, thank you for all of that uh, uh, from all of you. I think we have a number of uh, questions coming in from the audience. Um, uh, okay. One, I'll just sort of throw it out there and, you know, we can uh, maybe, you know, whoever sort of uh, that would be great. Uh, what are some of the um, biggest challenges in DeFi currently and why is DeFi not uh, uh, widely adopted yet? Maybe I can just kick off. I think going back to UI UX, right? If you look at the, the, the majority of the initial DeFi projects, for the average person to interact with that, it's extremely difficult. If I was to say to my parents, buy some Bitcoin, I'm pretty sure that they could do that tomorrow using a centralized application. But if I said, can you go buy some Bitcoin using a decentralized application? They wouldn't even know where to start. Now I think that there are solutions that make it much easier. And um, you know, a, a number of, of, of those have been mentioned on this, on this call today, but we're still at the beginning of creating a, a super easy to use UI UX for decentralized finance applications. Um, so I think that is, is the real starting point to making DeFi a little bit more mainstream. If you can make your average user interact with it as if they're interacting with a CeFi solution, suddenly it being DeFi doesn't become a hurdle, it becomes a real benefit. So making DeFi seem easy to use like CeFi currently is, I think will be a real catalyst in pushing the sector forward. Yeah, um, I think that's a great one. I want to kind of go a little bit more um, controversial in terms of at least in the blockchain space. I believe that scalability is one of the challenges uh, that DeFi faces today. Um, so for maybe I'll use a very like uh, classic uh, you know, example or, or way of describing this, but I think for some of the people here, since it's in Singapore, when I was young, they had this advertisement of, I think it was a broadband advertisement and it was of uh, this, 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 this shared pipe that goes into a toilet and there's uh, 10 different users and they are all turning on the water at once. And uh, when they do that, then there's not enough water for everyone. 
Now, I think what uh, we've seen in DeFi, at least uh, on some of the chains today, is that um, you know many of the applications are working great uh, during normal circumstances, but when you have large market movements, um, for example, the 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 market movements on on I think March twelfth. Um, where there was a, a major move of more than 50% of, of the Bitcoin, uh, sorry, of the Ethereum price, um, then everybody wants to get their transactions on at once. And um, so then what happens is the transaction fees spike. But more importantly, many of the applications uh, weren't designed uh, quite to handle this, you know, 5% case of, of a very challenging, um, you know, technical environment where you, you have no way to know if your transaction is going to get confirmed in, you know, one minute or five minutes, and um, what you what you have to do if your transaction is taking too long. What kind of uh, experience do you present the user with, um, and how do you take fallbacks? Now, you know, to use another example, like, uh, you know, um, back, you know, if you want to give the user a decent experience, then, you know if you typically are able to ship, you know, video at 720p, for instance, and suddenly your connection got downgraded to the 56, 56k modem, it's probably better to show them one image than try and like uh, shove all the data down the pipe. And so um, part of the maturization of this is that uh, applications will have to, you know, be battle tested and, and um, they have to deal with all these failure cases on how they can improve the experience even in a challenging environment. Uh, that's one. And then secondly, um, many blockchains are out there solving this scalability problem um, at, at all levels. And, and so I think that's one of the biggest challenges here that, uh, you know, uh, we need to get to. And also oh, to add on, sorry, sorry. Please. No, please go sorry. ahead. Yeah, so also to add on, right, security is also an issue. You see a lot of hacks, you know, uh, um, where, you know, like laymen typically actually uh, try to actually shy away from because, um, you know, when they hear, oh my God, you know, this exchange actually got hacked again, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, uh, maybe I should wait it out, you know, for uh, the, the, you know, the whole market to actually mature uh, and after regular step and, and, and start imposing regulation, things are going to be like better. Um, so uh, I think, uh, or, I mean, like, I think security, it's really something where, uh, a lot of uh, layman users or regular users actually care about a lot. Or, and I do know that, you know, a lot of DeFi projects, you know, uh, do a lot of uh, smart contracts auditing. But um, recently, because of yield farming, uh, like Josh was saying, you know, like, um, you, you don't know. I mean, they just, I mean, all this DeFi, the new DeFi tools are popping up, like, you know, every, every day. And, and they haven't, I mean, they, 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 they're not in the space for long, you know. So you can't really, you can't really, you can't really uh, uh, assess the team and also uh, and and the smart contracts that they built uh, and also the smart contract audit thing you know that uh, that 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 they conduct you know to to make sure that level of, uh, to ensure that level of security. So um, yeah, so security it's it's a, a big huge challenge. That's what I feel. But then sort of looking into the future a bit, right? How, I mean, one of the questions was how, 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 will your, how will the future of DeFi look like and what are the steps that are needed in order for DeFi to be omnipresent? <laughs> crystal well, ball, crystal ball. I mean, so in terms of what I, you know, there's many, there's many things in the future that we can't say for sure. But what I do strongly believe in is that the scalability issue will be solved. Um, there's... It's now no longer in simply a you know science level of science project where we don't know how to scale uh, a blockchain. Um, many of those ideas are already being implemented today, and in fact, some of them, whether at a layer two level or at a layer one or better better blockchain level, um, have uh, already several prototypes on the market that you know don't quite have adoption yet, but that we'll see being uh, you know ported back into Ethereum or in, you know through one way or the other being used by applications. So I'm pretty sure that the scalability problem will be solved, which will improve both the speed of settlement as well as the amount of transactions that can go through. And I think so that one, we're probably good. Now there's, there's uh, lots of other challenges that, that uh, you know, many, many of the panelists have s suggested that I think we uh, still need to get there. But on the scalability element, I think uh, 
three years, five years uh, is, is roughly the time that we could realistically see uh, it no longer being such a, such a blocker. Yeah, just very quickly for me, I'm just conscious of time, so I won't, I won't go on, on about it too much, but interoperability. I think that is a key theme in DeFi that we're yet to solve. Um, lots of teams build in silos, whereas decentralized finance should be as interoperable as possible. Um, I think we're getting there. There are lots of projects out there that are you know, building some fantastic solutions that, that really you know, are, are building bridges between different ecosystems. Um, and an interoperable environment will really create benefits for all DeFi participants. Um, I don't think we want to go into too much detail on, on which of those are, are out there, but I think interoperability right now is causing a lot of people headaches because they feel like they need to use one solution or one, another solution and, and they don't work together. Um, so that's one theme I think that we're seeing um, emerging, the, the desire to create an interoperable uh, ecosystem. Good one. Um... We kind of have a few more, t a bit of time for a few more questions. So um, I, I'd like to pick this one up on uh, KYC. And uh, Niaosi, maybe you, you'd like to take this. If DeFi can employ some sort of KYC protocol, interoperable and consistent, which is up to the standards of, let's say, financial regulators, do you think mainstream institutions or the CFI will find it easier to uh, integrate with DeFi? Um. So I'm not sure about the new DeFi products. I think KYC is just one of the compliance uh, issues we need to handle at the moment. Uh, because, uh, for example, for the let, let's treat the simplest DeFi thing. For example, the gateway. The gateway uh, you you swap from uh, USD to USDC, right? Uh, definitely, you can apply some KYC protocol. And I think right now we have some on-chain. Uh, protocols for the KYC, uh, but it's that's the minimum. And uh, the, the the only thing you can do that maybe you can just uh, buy some assets based on the KYC. And meanwhile, you can swap from some fiat to uh, the stable coins. But uh, for some recent uh, interesting DeFi projects, right, as uh, Jocelyn and uh, uh, Joshi mentioned, right? The the earning projects, or uh, as I can see, right? They right right now some option and the future project for this project, right? QIC is a minimum. You you need something else. So for example, uh, the license. Uh, if if we want to fully uh, want want it to be fully compliant with the current uh, regulation uh, rules or laws, right? You, you may need uh, this kind of license or. Uh, since it's crypto or these digital numbers, you you maybe it, it can be it can be exceptional, but there must be some uh, guidelines. Like what other things we can do, what the other things we cannot. Um, um, but at the current stage, as we can see, right, DeFi is still very new, and I think we still have a lot of uh, uh, potential. Uh, not 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 just on the products itself. Also, the potential maybe help us to re to re uh, review our current guidelines from our traditional finance industry, right? Whether it can, whether it's is a perfect uh, fit for the crypto space, or we should uh, um, <clears throat> amend the current guidelines or the laws or policies to be suitable for the crypto space. So yeah, as jo jo <laughs> Josh just mentioned, right? So there are a lot of um, discussions in different countries, for example, in Singapore. Uh, from ERAS, we, we can see that there is a guideline for the tax about the cryptos. And uh, also like like from uh, MAS recently, the, 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 uh, they released the, uh, some, paper, uh, some paperwork to discuss about uh, like how we uh, regulate the like sort of the wallets and the exchanges. So, so these are the all the uh, good movements to basically to help to sort of figure out the way to really uh, all we call regulated DeFi or we make a DeFi space more uh, suitable for ordinaries. Basically, it's a uh, like protection for the individual uh, investors. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, this one's an interesting question. I, I sort of uh, um, 
throw it out there just because we've got big names in it. With companies like Facebook developing, uh, you know, Libra, is this going to help the industry or do you think this is a threat to the industry? I think it's great. Uh, Facebook yeah. developing Libra is going to be an, uh, yet another on, on, on ramp for, for um, crypto. Fully agree. I think it, it catalyzes people's thinking, it gets people aware, it gets them used to using digital assets in, a, in an app environment. It's, it's going to be great for everyone, I think. Yeah, I think the best thing uh, for Libra that uh, I believe Facebook will have some super good user experience for different for all the users. Basically, even we use the payment via Libra, we couldn't see how Libra is running behind the scenes. So that sort of I would say the best way to engage with the ordinary users. So basically, we 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 shouldn't let them uh, understand or know that oh. Uh, behind the scene, there is a blockchain running there and there are a bunch of smart contracts. Uh, these things should be just at the back end. And uh, for users or customers, they, they may not need to know such uh, information. Uh, I think that regulators will start, uh, you know, scrutinizing like maybe crypto industry a bit more, you know, now that, um, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like Libra, I mean, I don't know if they're still on track of like uh, launching Libra, uh, but uh, I think um, I was tuning in, like I think at least three sessions of uh, the Congress hearing and um, the regulators and the authorities are not happy, you know, with how uh, Libra uh, it's forming, uh, you know, their, their, their governance and, 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 and stuff like that. So, cause it, they think that, you know, it is a threat to, uh, to, to the sovereign monetary policy. So I don't know, I think there, there's like good and bad, you know, like obviously, you know, people will be like, oh, you know, Libra, is that cryptocurrency? And, you know, and, and, and I see that, you know, like on the, on, on, on you know, on, on, on the other hand, you know, uh, different side of the coin, you know, people, people will start giving a lot more attention because they think that, you know, Libra is a cryptocurrency, but like, yeah, so. Great, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, let's see, let's do something that's a uh, bit sort of back to uh, security tokens. Any any thoughts as to the convergence or, or, or what, how security tokens will play in DeFi? Ben? Yeah, okay, I think this is an interesting one um, because by default, um, you know, Many DeFi applications are built in such a way that they use, uh, they're able to onboard uh, tokens that comply with the ERC20 standard. This is a common sta token standard that has uh, various, you know, transfer functions on it. And as long as tokens support those functions, then uh, they become eligible uh, to become, you know, part of a um, loan pool or part of a uh, or, or traded on on a a decentralized exchange, for instance. But at the same time, many of the security token standards, um, and there is also ERC-1400, that is a security token standard, does describe a way uh, that security tokens could be used, uh, could, could be set up such that, that they require a whitelist where um, only users on that whitelist may be able to transfer the token. So, um, uh, the what what happens there is that um, if um, they're set up right, then you could see DeFi DApps be able to still, uh, you know, these tokens still be able to take advantage of the applications that have been built for tokens in general. Um, so meaning any security token is still a token and, it, you know, it's very inexpensive to create a market for it. It's possible to create a, a loan book for it. Um, in, in a very inexpensive way. Um, uh, but at the same time, the only people with access to that market or that loan book uh, would have to be whitelisted. And uh, I think that, that that is one of the advantages of, of um, you know, several of the, the standards that, that work on the Ethereum network today um, that um, could be taken, taken advantage of here um, for this use case. It's not always that simple though, because uh, you know, there are complications when you try and create uh, a token that cannot always be transferred uh, to a destination address from a technical standpoint, um, because uh, within 
these smart contracts, they actually use secondary addresses sometimes and so on. Um, but that's the ideal case. Great. We have a very interesting question. It's a bit long, but I thought it'd be quite nice for a, a, a sort of a final uh, question and, and everybody can and jump in. Uh, Ron here has a, has a real conundrum. Uh, he's working with an entrepreneur who wants to build a company um, providing real estate crowdfunding investment opportunities to end users. Absolutely DeFi application. Uh, and the, the problem is he plans to have a company open in Vietnam. He's confirmed that uh, this entrepreneur does not know how to make DeFi legal on paper in the country. Uh, therefore, at this sort of technology decision state, he's li likely to go with a centralized application. Uh, Ron thinks that uh, it would be, uh, you know, that would be a great idea to use DeFi for a trustless system. Uh, if you guys were in his shoes, what would you say to convince this uh, FOZ entrepreneur? Wow, um, interesting dilemma. I think, you know, you can point to a number of of solutions built around the world that do elements of that already. Um, I.e., for example, tokenizing real estate tokenizing um, interests in real estate that have been generated via a crowdfunding method. So you can point to lots of successful applications of that, that kind of, I guess, that fundamental ethos. Now, the difficulty is not being a legal um, specialist in Vietnam. I don't know what the challenge that they're facing there is. But I would imagine that there is an existing regime that relates to how to crowdfund certain uh, assets whether that's a company, whether that's uh, some kind of special purpose vehicle. And if you can kind of think backwards and use some of the lessons learned that other um, service providers and other jurisdictions have all gone through already, I'm sure you can find a way to bridge your existing regulatory regime that you have in Vietnam with the fundamental technology that will be underpinning all of that. And it doesn't have to be DeFi for the sake of DeFi, but you can have DeFi powering different elements of your service. What we tend to see is quite challenging is when people build a centralized solution and then try and rebuild that thing to be decentralized. That's really difficult. And of course, that will attract a lot of regulatory questions. So I would almost encourage entrepreneurs that are trying to build DeFi is build, build smart, take your time to, to do your due diligence from a legal, regulatory and technical perspective at the outset. Um, and, and look at DeFi as, as a kind of a powerful tool that can underpin your business. It doesn't have to be the, the be all and end all for your business. You can still run a traditional business that is powered by DeFi. So think outside of the box and take some lessons learned from other jurisdictions. Great advice. Thanks, Josh. Uh, anyone else want to pick that up? All right. Uh, I think we've sort of come almost to the, the end of the session. Uh, I know we're, for some of us have a long day ahead of us, so I won't uh, keep you too long. I just want to say how much I enjoyed this session. I mean, this one and a half hours just kind of flew by. Uh, thank you so much for all your insights. I think it has been a fabulous session. I love the, the fact that we're all over sort of the world uh, and coming together to talk about really what is an extremely important trend in the financial services world. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope to see you soon. And you know, we'll hope to catch up separately with you uh, when you're in Singapore, or when we're in, uh, in your parts of the world. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.